So I think, there we go. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit at first about the challenges that museums and I think um, anybody studying parasites and pathogens uh, face when trying to deal with uh, both archiving samples and managing parasite data <clears throat> and pathogen data um, in the context of natural history collections and also in the context of being able to um, look at public health and test for pathogens, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so I think one of the most important things in terms of the best practices uh, from the point of view of collecting and tracking these things over time is that we need to consider that these samples and their host parasites and pathogens should share some sort of unique identifier that is assigned at the time of collection to the host and all derivative parasites, pathogens, samples, et cetera. To me, this is um, the most critical aspect of being able to track these things, whether they're in museums or elsewhere. Because, uh, and it hasn't traditionally been um, always the case that this happens. It's very easy for hosts and parasites to diverge from the moment of collection because of a couple of reasons. One is that people who are collecting parasites frequently don't um, save or archive the host. And vice versa, people who are interested in the hosts, mammals, birds, whatever, you know, plants, they frequently don't archive or document the parasites because they have different research interests. They have different um, uh, agendas in terms of what they're after. And they may incidentally come across a parasite or in the case of the parasites, they, you know, they don't have the resources, et cetera, to archive the hosts. So there's different people doing it. And even though, um, what's most important here is that parasites and hosts are sharing a locality and collecting event. They've been collected, removed from the wild at the same time, um, from the same place, and they should have then shared data. But because this typically ends up, you know, the parasites go to a different institution than the, um, the hosts. Sometimes they're, you know, they're, they're taken off by different people at different times. Um, they this, these data tend to diverge. They tend to be lost over time. So some way to have this shared identifier that tracks the hosts and all the derivative samples and parasites, and then keep the shared locality and collecting event data, uh, especially if there, it's a way to link to field notes, archives, media, something that would then be archived as well in order to document this collection and document what was taken at that time. Uh, another, I'm um, sort of going through a Christmas wish list here. We have the ability to do a lot of these things, but I think um, as a community, the natural history community, there's a lot of these things that we still don't have the ability to do. So um, ability to link samples across collections, institutions, and external databases, ideally, for, in my perspective, via a shared URL, something that you can use the internet for, that you can directly plug in a URL and land on someone else's page that says, here's the data you're looking for. So in the absence of a URL, there at least needs to be some kind of standardized identifier, but identifiers have a tendency to, to diverge too. So URLs are unique. They're very useful for that reason. We should have the ability to document testing methods and record presence absence data. For parasitologists, this is critical in order to be able to get an idea of prevalence of the, the, of, uh, a particular parasite. We need to know not only which hosts had a particular parasite at a particular place in time, but which ones didn't, how many were negative. And this I think is one of the um, biggest challenges for, for a lot of you know, museums that don't typically record absence data, um, but it is possible to do so. And I will be discussing that um, going forward. Also the ability to document usage um, in terms of loans and where things go to be um, uh, re what research products come out, what publications, sequence data, that should also be tracked between parasites and hosts and pathogens. There should be a way to, to um, if someone does a, a study and finds a virus, they should be able to come back to the original source vouchers for both um, for the host, or in the case of a parasite, the parasite needs to link to the host and the publications should follow. And all this is basically enabled by, ideally, reciprocal linkages, um, like ideally via URLs between hosts and parasite vouchers in museums, and then the external users and publishers 
in order to maintain the data chain between the specimens themselves that are archived in collections and their extended use. So, and let me see if I can do this. Doesn't want to let me go to the next slide. Everybody there? I'm gonna to have to stop sharing because my computer froze. Let me go to the next. I wanna show you an example of uh, the kinds of data that tip that we receive typically from specimens in museum collections that we're then having to try to track and try to the types of specimens that we're trying to track. This is a scanned image of uh, Robert W. Rausch's um, necropsy leisure. And Robert Rausch was a- uh, Hey, Marielle, you have to share your screen again. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you. Okay, share screen. So this is a, um, his, a scanned image of one of his pages from his field collections. And he was a parasitologist who worked in public health and veterinary medicine and wildlife disease in uh, Alaska and Canada um, over many, many decades, starting in the 1940s. And he um, kept this detailed ledger of all the hosts that he examined for parasites and his subsequent, what he found in them. And he, um, and we have copies of these that we have uh, scanned and archived. Now, um, this also, this collection was donated to the Museum of Southwestern Biology and sort of formed the basis of our current parasite collection. 2011, we began developing um, the Arctos database uh, that we use for the museum collections to be able to accommodate these types of data and be able to use these to link parasites and hosts. So what you're looking at on the left, the number is uh, his field ID. So this is his unique uh, identifier that he had assigned in the field to a particular host. Um, at the, it, he was very naive when he started out in the 1940s. I think he, he started giving things like blue jay number one, or you know red squirrel number two. He quickly abandoned that. His final necropsy ledger extends over over 50,000 um, organisms he's examined over his career. So the, he also went to preprinting ledger pages with preprinted numbers to try to avoid transcription error and try to avoid um, and try to keep things organized. Nevertheless, there were occasionally duplicates in the series that had to be resolved. But uh, he would take one of these pages with him in the field and then every line has a host on it and also all the parasites and any additional data, uh, host measurements, uh, the locality, the date, etc. Um, of the organism he examined. So I've highlighted this number 015515 on this page, which is a red squirrel, Tamiosiris hudsonicus, a female collected on October 8th, 1955 from 36.1 miles above Chitina in Alaska. It weighed 207.6 grams. And then if you look at the next three columns, he's examining the uh, endoparasites for cestodes, trematodes, and nematodes. And he's also putting little annotations in to say that this had a skull taken. So we know there's a host voucher somewhere, the skull was labeled. This had uh, Hymenolopus horrida is what he recorded for the cestode. So he found a parasite in 1955. Um, uh, he also on the far right has the measurements for the host. So what we um, are trying to do now is to keep after all these many decades, we have um, these specimens that he's recorded here are in museum collections. How do we link them? How do we manage them? How do we tie them back to their original data streams so that we can uh, track what has happened to them since? So this ledger has been um, uh, linked or tagged to our museum database. So if I click on this um, particular red box, it shows me that this is actually a, a specimen in our Museum of Southwestern Biology collections. If I click on that, it's going to take me to the Arctos record. Uh, this may be, display may be a little unfamiliar to some people, but I wanna talk about what's, um, what we have here and, and try to work uh, walk you through it. First off, the most important thing about this record is it has a URL. This is a unique URL that is related to this particular museum specimen. So we have the ability to share this. We have the ability to, um, uh, this is a basically our unique identifier at this point for this, this parasite, this tapeworm. Um, also notice that the, 
the scientific name here is not the same as what we saw in the ledger. If I go to identification, the identification table here and expand it, we'll see that Robert Rausch originally identified it as Hymenolophus florida, but it was subsequently uh, re-identified uh, re as uh, Alrostolephrus macrosclerosa in 2013, and there's publication links and links to the authors. So um, we have uh, identification, we have citations that link out as well with DOIs. We have the media tags that if I click on this, it would take me back to the tag media that we just looked at a minute ago. Um, and then another thing that's um, really relevant to my previous slides about the identifiers and having identifiers that follow parasites and hosts is this collector number over here on the right. We have Robert Rausch recorded as the collector, but um, if you look at his page, he just has a number, different, but his tags that go to museums that on the specimens may actually have a variety of different ways that that number is written or expressed. First off, it could it be just a single number with, with or without a leading zero here, 15515, or it could have his initials in front, RLR, 15515, with or without a space. So there's so many different ways that you can record an identifier and variations in this, um, this identifier can cause you to not be able to link specimens. You can't, you may not be, if you search on RLR space 15515, you might not find anything. In fact, I can do that in Arctos right here. If I search to see, are there any other collections that have something related to Rausch's RLR number? And I search here, I only find the same uh, specimen that I actually was just looking at. However, if I search on just the number by itself, I find a whole bunch of organisms, some of which are the same and some of which are not. For example, I've got a host here that has the same collector number and that was actually collected by Robert Rausch. So there's a record that's related to this. Um, here's a University of Illinois Museum that's not related. Here's a um, another, um, and here's a mammal record, you, it must be a mammal that, do, that is related and here's the original specimen. So it's really important to try to standardize as much as possible um, your, your identifiers that link these things, try to assign the same ones or if there are variations to include those variations in your specimen record so they can be located and found because this is our ultimate challenge and was our challenge was the Roush collection. We had all these, these data pages but we had no idea where the specimens were. We also had jars full of worms. We had boxes full of slides and we had some cases full of mammals, but we knew there were thousands of things in other institutions. How do we link them? How do we find them? So, and how do we also deal with, this is another issue, the negatives. This one, the next one, 15516, was examined by Rausch for parasites and it was found to be negative for parasites. That's a valuable observation made by a competent parasitologist in the same area at the same time. We should be able to also record that. So what we decided to do was to go through and transcribe these data as observations. And then as we found specimens to start linking them to their actual specimen vouchers. And if we didn't, it was just an observation that still allows us to be able to get at the presence absence data that we're looking for and uh, talk about um, and link them to their higher taxonomy. So back to this record, um, this particular parasite now also has, um, this is the host record that we transcribed from that same ledger page. And we created a separate host catalog just for these observations of that were made where we may not, we don't know, is there a voucher somewhere? Supposedly there's a skull of this squirrel, but we don't know where, at the time we made this, we didn't know where it was. We didn't know we, that actually we had it here. And there may be others at other institutions. So this skull is uh, also tagged in media, or this, this, this squirrel, back to that same page where we were a minute ago. And if you look at uh, all the way down, we have, we've captured all the attributes that Robert Rausch recorded, all those measurements that were on his page, and we captured um, that it's an observation, as opposed to uh, being a specimen record. We also have the 
recorded that it was examined for parasites by Rausch on the state, and we record the parasites were found. On the, we can have another record for this, um, for the, uh, for the uh, 15516, which would look pretty much similar to this, except that the parasites would found would be negative. Yep. So we can use that to capture that with the host catalog. This also allows us to embed this into a higher taxonomic structure. We can say how many squirrels were examined by Rausch and found to be positive or negative. We can do those kinds of searches as a result of having this host observation catalog. And in this case, we actually did find the, um, the host voucher. So this is the actual squirrel that he made a specimen of, and it's at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. And we create these relationships, host of and same, in, uh, same individual as, using the URLs that I showed you earlier. This URL here goes and becomes, um, if I log in, I can go and say this um, MSB host 777333 is the same individual as this record or that this um, parasite, this, this record is a host of the parasite using URLs as a way to create reciprocal relationships and pull data in from one record to another. So this is sort of a lot of information, like how are we creating these linkages? What, what are we trying to do um, to make this discoverable? Um, what I'd, let's see if I was gonna go ahead. I wanna show you something that may be a little bit more familiar. Uh, than the Arctos records. This is the same parasite at GBIF, just to show how we are then, we have our we have our public database, people can search our public database, but we're also publishing Darwin Core to aggregators such as GBIF. And in this case, we have um, our URL identifier saying that this is a, a parasite with a single occurrence. And we also have the media linked uh, slide images linked, and we show that um, this is uh, a parasite of the host and the mammal through associated occurrences. So we're able to not only do this within our own database, but to publish out via Darwin Core so that this, the, these data are available through aggregator. Okay, so let me go back to um, an example, I really wanted you to see the host observational catalog because that's one of the other critical things for being able to do presence absence. All right, so what I'd like to do next is pass the, um, the screen over to some of the other institutions that also have, um, I'm gonna stop sharing, also have parasite data. Um, Andy, are you able to share your example or you want me to share it um, from Denver? Yeah, I think I can walk through it. Okay, I'm passing over to Andy Dahl, who's going to share some examples from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Are you seeing that? Yeah, yeah can you increase the magnification a little bit? Is that better? That's good. Okay, uh, so here we have one of our uh, Colorado chipmunk records um, collected by our curator here, John Dombosky. And he is the one who did all the legwork of getting all these, all the data in, the linkages made. Um, so we have him to thank for all of this. Um, <clears throat> so you can see first on the right, we've got uh, several citations that are associated with uh, this chipmunk. Um, we've got the two voucher records where they published on the chipmunk in question, but then there's also host voucher. So uh, the this top one and the bottom one are actually citations working on the parasites, but those are linked into the host record also, which I think is great. Um, each, of, each of these, you can look at the species page, you can look at the Arctos publication record, um, and then there's a DOI to the actual uh, publication where you can download it. Um, I'll note in this bottom one, there's a little page symbol here. That is an actual, copy of the publication that's been uploaded into Arctos and you can access it directly. Um, we've got media showing the, the chipmunk skins um, here. Over on the right side, you can see our additional identifiers. Uh, there's our tissue number, a link to a Dryad publication, 
the GenBank publication of the sequence data on the chipmunk, and then the collected number. Beneath that, we have the parasites that were um, collected from this chipmunk. Uh, we have three different ones. There was a, a tick, a flea, and then uh, parasite 64 here, which is a sucking lice. Um, so each one of those, you click on it, it brings you to the parasite record. Um, again, you can see the. this is the same citation that was in the last record, but this one it's the voucher of, not host voucher of. Uh, but they're both linking to the same publication. Uh, let me expand all of these. Uh, so here in the relationship section, you see again, the link back to the host voucher, um, the chipmunk right there. Uh, you can see the attribute data that's been attributed to these uh, parasites, the sucking lice. Um, there is larva and nymphs, and then there's uh, sex information all determined by Casey Bell. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is, um, I, I noticed there that we don't have our uh, linkage of the tissue number back, which most of those have. Sorry, ignore that. Um, yeah, I don't know, Marielle, what else you'd like me to run through on this? Do you have any? There's the projects that they're associated with, um, both the chipmunk, and that captures the parasite. Um, you could, um, the, the data for the host uh, collecting event is potentially shared with the, the, the all the parasites. Um, yeah. So, so in see, fact, you can see that when it pulls over. It's the same locality and there's actually media tied to that locality. So you can see images of the actual habitat um, and that is pulled into the parasite record as well. Um, there's comments on the actual parts, how many lice, how they're preserved. And those lice are then um, transferred to your the parasite records, correct? Um, well, you're in the parasite record. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but start you start out see, as ectoparasites. You can see the linkage to the other parasites, the um, the tick and the fleas that are here. So you can jump back and forth across all the associated records from any any one of these records. You can get to all of the rest of everything that was collected together uh, as part of this single chipmunk. Why don't you quickly go to the project page just to see sort of the extent of how many different um, records are linked. Okay, so here's the project page, uh, a comprehensive multi-gene phylogeny of chipmunks. Um, John and Casey were the PIs in that. Um, you can see the several publications are tied to this project. So the four that we saw in that chipmunk record, but then also additional ones that are tied to other specimens collected under this project. Um, you can see that they're tied to 58 MSB records, in addition to our Denver records. Um, and then there's additional projects which had brought in specimens that also contributed to this project. So you could click through each one of these and see kind of a broad scope of how all this stuff gets into museums and gets tied together and used for various sorts of research. And you Great. can see all the media associated with all those different records, some of those same photos from the parasite and chipmunk record. Great, thank you, um, Andy. And if you want to transfer over to um, Gabor, he's going to share some examples from Howard Mancher. Oh, Harold Mancher, excuse me. Yes, share screen. I think hopefully you are seeing uh, my Arthos. Uh, so I did a, a quick search. Um, actually, um, you can see it, it's highlighted um, 
Arctos can be, if you know how to do it, you can query Arctos through the browser. So it's actually defining that uh, search uh, everything in the uh, HVML parasite collection. And here I define the other that, uh, because we are looking at these association host associations, that uh, everything that has also an associated MSB mammal number. And we have a good number, there should be more, but uh, we have a good number of, uh, of links. And some of these are really good examples how uh, this system works. So let's grab the first one when I linked uh, out this. This is a, um, this, the specimen itself is collected as part of the Bolivian, uh, uh, what was it actually, uh, Bolivian, uh, with mammal surveys with mammal the American survey yeah, yeah with mammal the american parasite. museum so uh, usually and the complicating thing is that uh, specimens collected there got um, got uh, 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 distributed among different institutions so the parasites many of the parasites through scott garner who was part of the project ended up here at the mentor lab and um, this is a holotype and uh, and usually um, um, I can click on it. I don't know if if there is if it it immediately takes you to the actual voucher. So that's the beauty of it. And um, usually, what happened then in the field, the the specimen identification might have been different. Uh, Marianne would, would know it that how they ID many of these. Uh, uh, of these mammals are still in the field data they are identified under a, a colomis boliviensis maybe that was how it was originally identified mariel do you know if there was another identification if you went to expand identifications it would show oh, you their I'm not history logged in so you should still be able oh, to that, see yes. it yeah 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 uh, so okay. the original so. field id was still oxymetrous permanence okay but, uh, so it was confirmed through the so many of the field IDs were either they used an old name or, uh, or later they realized that there are some cryptic species. So they were, uh, they were split into different species. And um, there is a, uh, what happened that some of the uh, actual specimens went to American Museum of Natural History and they are not part of the artist system. So usually, maybe Mariel will later, it's a possibility to link their, to their online search engine. And um, some of the specimens went to MSB. And I noticed that there were some questions um, regarding these uh, uh, observation. So sometimes the host is recorded as observation. So we are still a little bit um, struggling with this ID, whether, and, and sometimes uh, for the host, there is an observation uh, record created. And the reason is because you can capture way more data that way. And sometimes um, actually we, uh, we don't have that observation data because it's uh, 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 captured as, Actually, here it is that uh, so, some of the, the host data is actually uh, pulled into the attributes. And that's why it's uh, sometimes some people have hard time finding records in our data. So actually I have, um, so you have to search in the attributes, the ver verbatim host ID equals to some species, for example, Paramiscus maniculatus, and it will find, for example, I have um, a similar search. Oops. To, to do that. Um, I'm looking at another example. Um, this is also, um, um, it's interesting because you are following the links and, uh, and we have a catalog specimen, the mesocestoides uh, tapeworm. 
and uh, the host data, so the host uh, voucher was deposited at MSB. So if I click on it, I can see the actual data. And my understanding is that some of the specimens got also cataloged at MSB. So, so there is a associated parasite. So probably this is, in, in this case, it looks identical that the, the sample got split into two and deposited at two institutions. So MSB parasite have, um, if actually because I clicked on it, MSB describes it whole organism and they are preservation mode, they are slide mounted. And there are also some fluid preserved specimens uh, associated with this record. And in our possession, um, what we have, we have only the slides, for example. And just jumping back to, again, the Bolivian um, project, The importance of this, actually, I will just, so I followed the link, this is the host for that uh, holotype. Um, what's important is that the actual tissue samples are deposited at MSB and they are MSB mammals. Is that right, Marielle? So yes. in this case, so there is one of those that it's, uh, uh, this example, well, actually, uh, in this case, there is the, the actual vouchers at MSB are tissue samples. And the skin and skeleton is, uh, is uh, deposited at the American Museum of Natural History. Okay. Um, anything else that I should show, Marielle, or? I think that's pretty good. Or uh, does anybody have any questions before we move on? Marielle, well, there I, was, oh, oh, go ahead, yeah. Andy. Uh, I was just gonna say, I, one thing I meant to mention was that uh, the link to Globy. Um, yeah. I, I don't wanted know if you're to gonna cover that later. Let's go ahead and open it. Oh, actually, I will cover it later. So let me do the next example. Um, okay. the, yeah. We had one quick one, Marielle, about um, in the case where you basically had taken the Rausch ledger and first cataloged the host as observations, um, when you did discover that some, in fact, you did have the voucher specimen, um, did you simply change the basis of record to voucher, or did you actually just create a second voucher record and maintain both? Wait. We are maintaining both at the, at the moment. And the reason for that is that because we have the original data, we have in many cases way more data, including the, the media archives that we can link to that record than, um, than are frequently available for different collections that have the voucher specimens, which are frequently were cataloged based on just limited information on the tag. And uh, so, and then we create a relationship, same individual as between the host observation record and the external record or the other, the actual voucher. And that's kind of how we've been proceeding so far. There's, um, there was some discussion about even eliminating observation as a part and going to changing. So yes, I mean, we need to, rather than collection as, so basis of record in Arctos is, I am, and Teresa's on the call, she can correct me, um, is what we call sort of um, an, an event type. So it's a, was it a collection? Was it an encounter? Was it an observation, et cetera? So um, that's something that has evolved since then. And I think maybe we should consider changing how we publish it to make sure that it's clear that the MSB host record is an observation and that there's a voucher somewhere else. In some cases, we there is no voucher anywhere else. And to be able to search say I find all find all fleas collected from squirrels in Alaska in 1951 we have to have those observations to be able to execute those kinds of searches so you know we want to be able to keep them even if there's no voucher that's ever discovered and I'd be happy to talk about that more later too in terms of the like what we could do best to make it most discoverable and 
So let me quickly go into another example. Let me share my screen again. Um, go, where am I? Um, I think, yeah. Okay, so this record here um, is an example of um, a shrew at MSB that um, was uh, collected in uh, 2006. And we were struggling because it was used as a, it is a symbiotype for a virus. Now viruses, we're still working on how to link to viruses as they typically don't get deposited in museum collections. It's not a part of natural history collections. So how do you maintain a host virus uh, a connection when, when you have, um, the host is what is a symbiotype, meaning that it's, it, you know, it's, there's a type specimen of the virus. So it's super important to be able to create these linkages and to document the, the value for, from the host perspective, and also to be able to, sit, to document for the virology community that, hey, there is um, an actual voucher for this virus that has additional tissues, that has additional sort of identification, verification for the, the host, which may change through time. In this case, we have this host has been used for quite a few um, papers. And as you can see, every time we've added another ID, like this molecular methods have confirmed the identification of this particular individual. And we can track the history of that. We can track all the history of the uh, papers. So it's a voucher uh, for a particular, there's a GenBank sequence here that's related to the host. And in fact, when we created the relationships between hosts and parasite, we were actually using a model using reciprocal URLs that we have um, we had previously had in place with GenBank. If I click this GenBank link, there's actually nothing there. Interesting. Um, so there's normally uh, some sort of a GenBank link. Here's one over here. Let's go over this one. Um, here's a, the, a GenBank link to um, that Arostrolep as I showed you earlier. And there's a link back out, which goes back to the parasite. We can create these links reciprocally because if we put in the GenBank identifier in, in an Arctos record, it creates the reciprocal link out at GenBank uh, automatically. And then there's the GenBank identifier there. But what I want to show you from this record, where it should where it was a minute ago, um, the SORX, is that um, this particular record, because it's the shrew, the SORX, the GenBank link goes to the SORX, but it's also host of viruses that are at GenBank. And so if I click one of these GenBank links here that it's the host of, it's host of the Kenkemi virus. And so we have the link um, and we link back out to the mammals uh, record as the host. Now there's no host voucher published in the uh, voucher field at GenBank. We really like to encourage people who are depositing samples to do so, to have some kind of museum link. But again, there's no voucher virus somewhere. Um, so how do you do that? Um, so we'd, all we have is, is the host and by being able to say, specify through our identifiers tab that these sequences are, um, that this record is the host of these sequences, we're able to um, create that linkage even in the absence of a voucher specimen of a virus and document the, uh, those publications and those sequences. Now, to be able to do this, um, one of the great things that we've done recently is to partner with Globy. And uh, Globy is Global Biotic Interactions. And they are not only taking our relationship data, they're interested in any kind of biotic interaction. So host parasite falls in there great. Um, and they're publishing that on their website. And uh, we also have a link from our pages to Globy. So if I click this here uh, from our page, it not only gives me information about the record I was just looking for, um, but any other sources of documentation that this species of shrew, Sorex roboratus, is a host of the Kikemi virus. And it's supported by this Arctos record. Um, and they also have the reciprocal. The virus here has the host of Sorex roboratus. And Globy, then you can you can use their site to search for all kinds of interactions, um, including viruses. And then we're working with them to partner so that we can help use their data 
to um, help discover things that we're missing. We, there may be other sequences at GenBank that we haven't yet picked up that are related to our records, um, especially if they're viral sequences and, or you know, if they're unpublished material. So we're, we're just, um, we're expanding our ability to link out to, to these external resources outside of Arctos. I wanted to um, next go into like follow up on what um, what Gabor was showing you. It's like, how do you find this stuff? Uh, I mean, if you're familiar with sort of the GBIF searches, it's, the search tools are fairly limited. Um, Arctos is, um, this is our sort of main page to get to Arctos. But if you go here, you can also search Ar Arctos, which, and that will take you to our search page, which is actually, let me go here, um, the arctos.database.museum. And I'm currently logged in, so I see a lot of stuff, but um, I'm gonna log out here so it's pretty clear. We're gonna have to get rid of all these, trying to get rid of these control panels that are blocking. Okay, hide video panel and hide floating meeting controls. There we go. Okay, so if I log out, um, this is sort of our main public page. Now, Arctos is at about 250 some odd collections with over 4 million records. So we have a shared communal database. So if you search on collection, you have the option of picking a given collection. Um, or you can um, just search a uh, collection wide. You can also expand these options. Any of these panes have expansion so that you can be, you, for example, can search on ID, you can search across um, taxonomic levels, et cetera. Uh, you can search on geography, and I'll show a few more of these options. But this um, search tools, also I wanna show really quickly, uh, if you go to the portals page, and you're interested in parasites and specifically, if you search on, if you click on collection, it will sort the different collection types. And again, you can scroll down and see, hope I'm not making you sick, um, down to the P's. We have about uh, 10 parasite collections that you can choose to search on. And also um, in mammal collections and birds and reptiles, et cetera, that can be specifically selected. Now, um, what if you want to find hosts and parasites or something that has a host and or a parasite? The place to search for those would be under the relationships page, which is right here. You can search for something that's um, a host of, and I could search for anything that's a host of a, um, an identifier. I could say I want a GenBank number. Um, let's see where to find everything that's a host of a GenBank number. Or you could um, say that you want to find a host of a uh, family sciority. Or, excuse me, that's the wrong one. Host of family hymen. No, that's spelled right. Okay, hymen all of this. I'm going to do identification. Um, so you could put a genus name there, like hymen all of this or uh, Cestoda. Uh, and you can use those tools to find everything in Arctos or in a specific collection to be able to look for hosts and parasites. The other thing that you can search on are, um, um, let's expand this out. To, you can search on attributes. Um, you can search on whether something was examined for parasites. So you can look on Indoparasite, look at E endoparasite examination or endoparasites detected. You can search on either of those. And when you do your um, search uh, query, let's see, do I have one here? Um, and you get a search result. Here's an example of, a, of a, the search results that I showed you earlier. You can decide which data, what types of data you want to download by going to the tools menu here that I just clicked on. And you might want to select, I not only want these sort of standard data that I see that I'm given as the default, I might want other catalog numbers, which might include GenBank numbers. 
Perhaps I want a uh, related record summary or related items. And then maybe I want attributes such as whether or not it was examined for parasites and whether those were detected. I can select all these things and then I can refresh that. And then you can um, get additional information on what was a parasite, what was a host. And if I log in, I can, um, and this is a public, any public person can create a user account and download these data. So if I, I'm, I'm, log I'm not logged in at all yet, but if I log in as a public user account, I could download these data as well as CSV. Okay, um, the other thing would be the types of things that you can download for attributes. Let me demonstrate that really quickly as well. Um, are one of the other really neat ones is tested for presence. And we also have, we have seen nombre hantavirus results. You could get that information or tested for, for presence. If I refresh that, I, I will get columns for all that, but I don't have any data to um, fill those out. I can show hide my search terms. I can go back to my search page and show you where to search on those. I want, maybe you want to find anything that had something tested for presence. What does that mean, tested for presence? Um, let's go here, tested for presence. It's in alphabetical order, tested for presence. Um, so the tested for presence has been used in Arctos so far to look at water samples that were tested for a, the DNA of a particular amphibian. Uh, I think um, to, for endangered species survey. So let's just go to this first one. This one was tested uh, using qPCR um, for Lithobates sylvaticus. So it was tested for uh, wood frogs in, in lakes in Alaska. We're hoping to expand this out to use this to test for uh, pathogens and have the same kind of thing where even if the host was negative, we could create a host uh, observational record and say it was tested um, and perhaps it was negative as well but allows us to ca capture negative data. And we have the ability to say what method was used. In this case, we actually did end up with DNA that was archived at the University of Alaska. And we have um, some information on how uh, that DNA was extracted, et cetera. So this is sort of a work in progress, being able to deal with environmental DNA, but also this converts to being able to use for pathogen testing as well. So we're... Um, Getting close to the end here, I wanted to take any questions that might be available. And I, we do have, uh, for those of you who are Arctos users who want to know how to use the tools, um, we don't have enough time today to go through that, but I'm happy to do some more video tutorials and uh, uh, happy to also talk to people specifically about how to get these data in there. For We can do uh, bulk data entry, uh, linking parasites and hosts. We can do individual... Um, data records and we can pull parasite and host data in, data in from one record to the other. So if there are questions on that, I can also um, arrange to do that again at a later time. Do we have questions now? And feel free to unmute. We have several in the chat. Um, I'll give you the option to just unmute first and if not, I'll go ahead through and read them. Should I stop sharing my screen or? My question, you know, that I that I posted and, and Emily answered about, you know, part of it, um, like one of the things that we capture a lot of is like we're we're literally quantifying the parasites off of every host that we quantitatively sample, and that way we can, you know, we can, in addition to prevalence, we can, uh, you know, and we can't do this for everything that we do, like malaria. We don't um, unless we're screening slides, we're not looking at intensity. We're only looking at prevalence, but. Um, and most of the work that we've done on malarial parasites is just focused on prevalence right now because of that. But, um, but for ectoparasites and lice, we're counting, you know, we're literally like, like sitting at the scope, counting how many males, females, nymphs of every taxon that we find in a given vial and then capturing that in our database. But I mean, so far, yeah. I, I'm like, I'm sold. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. So to answer your question, we do can do intensity because we have basically a lot count, which is a quantity. So if you have um, if you have uh, 
any kind of part, it's part of our parts. There's a, a one of the fields is lot count or quantity. And so if you have 10 lice and three fleas and two ticks, you can put that in there. And, and if, um, if they were in the same vial, so for example, like we don't end up, we even though we sort and count, we end up putting them back in the same vial ultimately for the most part, unless we're, unless we know we're sending mites to somebody or sending ticks to somebody, like all the lice, hippobacid flies will usually stay in the same vial. So it's, it's kind of like one lot, but it has many, you know, there are many pieces of that lot. There are like many genera or many species found in that given lot. So there's a couple ways you can record that. Um, when, what I like to do eventually, and this is sort of a, it's always a, it's a parent child problem. You've got the original vial of all the ectos collected from the host. And then that vial starts getting split and sent off to different researchers who are specialists in those different groups. And then become slides, or they become fluid preserve, or they become um, uh, uh, DNA extractions. And so we have the ability to track that parent child relationship across collections and we can use object tracking for that. But you, there's also many places where you can put information on, well, this original this original uh, lot had, you know, was just a hundred ectoparasites, but that five of those were fleas. And we now have a new uh, vial with five fleas. Um, and we can, there's a remarks field, you can track all this stuff and there's part attributes and we can add more and more part attributes. Let me just show you really quickly, um, if I can share my screen. Um, kind of what the, the part attribute situation looks like. This is that, um, this is a slide of that uh, tapeworm that we looked at at the very beginning. And you can see there's two slides in this, for this record, but, um, oops, something's missing. I'm not logged in. That's what it is. Um, let me re-log in. So when you're not logged in, you don't have any sort of ability to go in and edit the records, which is, um, but it's still publicly available unless you choose to hide it. Collections can mask data. Um, so if I go here to edit the parts table, I have a remarks field. Um, I have attributes preservation. I could add additional attributes to these slides, including um, what we should add here maybe is, um, is count or something for this individual part. Um, and that may also be, uh, we have remaining volume, we have condition report, tissue quality, et cetera, storage temperature. So all of these things, because it's easy to add data fields for us as we need them. I know that's not true in some other databases, but um, we, we try to have a discussion first because we want to make sure that um, it's not just usable for one collection, but it because this is a shared platform, it's a shared online platform, and it needs to be usable for everybody. But generally, it, um, if we agree on data fields, we, we can choose to add them. So adding in an intensity attribute would not be that difficult. Same thing over here, we've got the location and host attribute, we've got an age class attribute. Um, the intensity attribute would probably make more sense being with the host record. Um, so this one is interesting because it, there's the, the actual vouchers at the University of Alaska Museum, but MSB has the uh, host observation. So we could add in here, these are a list of types of attributes, intensity or um, uh, parasite intensity or something. And yeah, we could discuss that. Any cool. other questions? Um, one, one other question. So like, what is the process of getting, you know, so like, let's, let's say, let's say we said, okay, we want to put all of our data in Arctos because right, right now, like the, the situation at the Academy is we actually have all of our databases in FileMaker databases, basically. Um, and my parasite data is actually in a MySQL, like basically a, it's a MySQL database that was built for me by a company when I was in Chicago. Um, and um I'm kind of done with it. I would like to move it into something like this ultimately, honestly. Um, yeah, so what's the process of that? Well, we, you know, once you decide you want to do it, we set up an MOU between institutions and the base, and then we start tackling your data. And then if you can get it into CSV format um, in any way, we'll go through and start mapping fields and just be, uh, we do, we have control vocabularies. We have, uh, you know, we, we try to do a lot of data cleanup at the outset just to make sure because it matches our control vocabularies, like agents, for example, here's Eric. Um, 
he actually exists as an agent. Um, so we don't want, we, we try to go through and clean up names, taxonomic identifications, anything so that it um, we can avoid problems with loss of, of data due to misspellings or to you know alt variations. And, um, the, but that's it. Yeah, we sit down and start mapping your data and, and going through and, and loading it um, as soon as it's ready. We, we have a mentor cool. and, and a migration uh, a mentor who assists with that process. Okay, cool. That's good to Jason, know. I put the link uh, for you to check out. Uh, we are approaching time. I'm sure our um, hosts are probably willing to hang on for questions, um, but I just want to thank you all for coming and we are recording this. So if you have to skip out, um, you can check out the recording with the rest of the Q&A um, at your convenience, so. Looks like Sarah says that there needs to be a discussion on data fields for host records where people are working on the parasites of the host but are not creating parasite records. As and um, so there are um, yes, I mean the parasites. There's always the issue of the parasite being a part of or some sort of a data field of the host rather than being its own data record. Sarah, do you want to discuss that at all, or just you know? Is no, well, just briefly, I was thinking through Jason's question earlier about how he records, you know, individuals of each sex and then the prevalence and intensity and all that. And so I just assumed, oh, well, of course, that's a parasite record he's putting those data into until I realized it's not. He's not putting it into anything. It's just how do you record that? So I went back and looked at... Uh, looked at some of the records that we have to see if, um, if there's a way to, to better capture some of the parasite biology, which really just often gets down to numbers and where it is. And it's something that I've been wanting to do forever and forget about because there are a bazillion things to do. But in at least for our host records, which is just host, it's not bird, it's not reptile, it's not mammal, it's just host because we have, uh, for a lot of reasons, mainly the Rush collection. You, know, there is nothing there where I can say because it says endoparasite examination, yes or no. Okay, so you did that, but then, well, what did you examine? Did you examine everything? Did you only examine the GI tract? And it makes a huge difference. Most people examine only the GI tract. But for all the work that I did for a lot of those uh, birds, the only thing I examined was usually the mesenteries and the livers for, for a subset when I was by myself. So yes, endoparasites were examined, but I didn't look for anything else. And I would make notes, but that's not very useful either, and I forget to do it. So. Um, so it would be good then too to have like either the host record or a mammal record, bird record, whatever it is, snail record, so that if someone can't create a parasite record from it, can you take the host record and turn that into a parasite record? Maybe you can do that now, but if you had the organs that were examined, especially with um, controlled vocabulary, then that makes it that makes it pretty good too. But that's Actually, that's something huge. <laughs> We do have that, Sarah. We can do um, for the examine for parasites, you can say methods, and then you can put in your methods GI only examine for helminths or blood smear for malaria or whatever you're examining. You can do that. Also, there is, a, I think, an attribute of um, well, there's the location in host, so you can say where it was found, and I think that has some controlled vocabulary for organs. Um, changing that into you know parts examined, I think if that doesn't already exist, should be easy to do. But yes, I think this definitely we're 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 sort of starting to capture these data. We would love to have an even bigger community of people to come in and like help us really, you know, create a, a, a good framework for capturing all the data. And, and I think that just like takes you know, you know more community input. Right. Yeah. I stand. I don't think it's standardized across all the records yet. And for the parasite, you can say location and host, but that's only for that cestode, for example. That doesn't say anything about the the other things. And it's nice that the host record can capture that. Too. Yeah, I think the host record right now, the only place to put it is in remarks. So I'll say something like, you know, cestode, 95% ethanol, you know, from small intestine or from duodenum or something, I mean, you know, but that goes in remarks and having a more specific controlled vocabulary would be good.